Hi, my name's Doug, and I'm going to take 10 minutes or so to take you through what's in our 6.8 release, which will be out December of 2016, and give you a preview of what's coming in our 7.0 release, which will be out in the spring of 2017 timeframe. So 6.8, um, there's five, well, four things within the target of December 16. First, there's a bunch of changes to how we do predictive analytics, um, both in how you set models up and how we report output from models. Now, second, uh, we have a new chart, a text chart, where you can put text, formatted text links and stuff in the middle of a project page uh, surrounded by the other charts. Uh, three, we've made a bunch of updates to our expression builder, especially in the area of date calculations. Fourth, we've made improvements with the flight recorder, how we label axes, and then we are fully capable of, of high DPI resolution screens. So let's go through each of these. Analytics. So we have done some reformatting of the model built-in pages and taken some of the controls that would have been on the um, master panel here and put them on the model build panel. Specifically, the p-value has moved over here, and the training subset has moved over here. Second, within the training subset, it used to be that we would default to training against the entire population in the table. And so if you have a million rows, we would train against a million rows and allow the user to set that down if they so desired. The problem was people weren't setting it down so often we would be hearing about three-hour model runs because the first run would be through a million rows. Our default has been changed in the 6.8 release, so that it's the greater of the total number of rows in the table you're modeling against were 10,000. So if you have a million row table, we're going to first, uh, by default, go against this random sampling of 10,000 rows, which is 1% of the population, which is statistically fine and gives a good result. But the impact is, instead of a three-hour model run, you're going to have like a 90-second model run. And then the goal would be if you, you, know, you iterate a few models, you get one you like, you then step up with the slider, the training subset, to higher percentages of the sample and let it run longer. So that's going to have a huge impact on those of you who have seen long model runs and because the default will be set way down and you're not going to have long model runs. Uh, we've also added a save button on the model build panel so that if you create a model and you run out to lunch, for example, and don't have time to run it, uh, you can save the model and come back and re-execute it when you come back from lunch uh, or whatever. Um, so that lets you save the model before it runs through the training subsets and actually executes. We also added a bidding uh, capability up here. Now, you could always do this in our expression builder, but now right in the modeling panel, you can bin categorical fields. So this is useful, for example, if you have city as one of the fields uh, in your model and you have, say, 4,000 cities, and you've got you know 200 of them with reasonable populations, and then the rest of them have, like, you know, two people, five people, four people, like in small towns. That's not a statistically uh, relevant sample. So this tool will let you then bin all the small populations into one called other. And then the cities where you have relevant uh, or towns with relevant populations would model as distinct categorical val values, uh, like New York and Boston and Chicago and so forth, with all the smaller towns and bin into uh, other. So that it facilitates um, binning of categorical fields. We also allow you to copy a model. So if you have a model, uh, maybe it's for you know best customers, and you want to edit it and not but not change the one you already have, you can copy the model, rename it, which saves all of the you know the uh, explanatory factors you've selected and the the, the the subsets you've selected to target against, and then you can add in additional explanatory factors, or you might want to maybe you run a you know, a regression model against a specific field. You want to then come back and try it as a classification model against a selected subset. Uh, you can copy the model over and have, you know, basically the, the two runs. So big, big changes there to help people more efficiently build models. On the output side, our, our, our predictive modeling, we've changed how we calculate the percent, call it a contribution of the influence on the target. Um, so before we would list the influence of each of the factors, and if it was a categorical field like city, we'd show each of the cities and their relative weight. Uh, we have now, uh, in that case, grouped them into the field influence. So for example, uh, fund type is a categorical field. It doesn't list, list the impact of the individual funds. It shows that fund type is responsible for, it looks like down here, you know, 15% of the overall influence on the target. 
Then over in the map here, you can see the impact of the different fund types. Like it looks like there's um, one here, the bond type has a positive influence and the others are pretty neutral. So the split uh, of what the detail would be over in the MAC. So this makes it much easier to understand what is actually influencing the target. In this case, three-year performance is the biggest influence and it looks like it's about 35%. Five-year performance is second at about 30% then it drops off on these other three factors. So we've a lot of work there on the math and how we calculate this um, big improvement in how you can understand model influence in the target. We've also added you know, regression lines and changed some of the other details in, in the output charts, but that's the big change here. So those things will, uh, on the analytics side, should help you build um, models more efficiently and have better, quicker understanding for the output of the model. All the other stuff is the same. Um, you know, the, the equation saved in the project will re-execute when the data loads, uh, all of that stuff. You can, it creates bins, but you can re recreate the bins, relabel the bins. All of that capability is unchanged. Uh, the second thing is text and pages. So we have added another chart, which is available from the chart toolbar or from the task view when you set up pages. And it's a formatted text chart. And you know you could put text in the page that will sustain in the page. Uh, sometimes if you have sections of the pages, uh, maybe there's three charts on customers or three charts on the right on products, you could put like header uh, to group the charts together. So there's a variety of ways uh, that the text chart can be used, and it's been suggested by a number of you and it's it's now available and you know I'm looking at the authoring tool here but if you publish this out to the web version the chart would work there as well and as you can see you can have links and connections and whatever else you want to put in it so next the expression builder we've done a bunch of work on date calculations so there's a new function called date which will create a date out of a year month and day so if you put like 2015 um, 0415 is going to create a date field for April 15th of 2015. And then all the date expressions will work off of that. So you know, maybe there's an event or there's some start of a campaign or something that happened at that specific date. You want to have it to then do offsets from the different events that occurred during the campaign. Uh, you can now create you know, the start date and then it, it, it is in the project. Um, you can offset dates by adding and subtracting days. So you can, if there's a date and you want to advance it or, or, or uh, bring it earlier, you can move it. That same capability is now going to be a one simple calculation to create fiscal dates because you'll have a calendar date. You just put in the offset and it's going to translate all the, you know, the months and the quarters and whatnot to the fiscal date uh, properly. Today, obviously, we create fiscal dates all the time, but it's a several step process. This simplifies it. We've also cleaned up um, a number of the logical expressions weren't working properly with dates. Uh, that's been fixed. Missing values are also fully supported across all the date calculations. And the expression builder, we've also now allow you to put comment text in to your calculations. And this has been a useful suggestion from a number of you. Um, have a complex calculation and you want to have right in the expression, you know, what, what is this that I'm doing here and why? Uh, other stuff, the flight recorder uh, has been improved. Um, there were certain conditions where it didn't execute properly. Those have been remedied, so it works across undo, redo, and all the other stuff that it should. Access labeling improvements. We've done some work on formatting, so uh, we collapse and summarize better. We center on charts better, um, all of that. High resolution screens, DPI, high DPI screens. Uh, caused problems with some of our icons and wizards in the past. That's been corrected, so everything should show properly. Uh, per project directory access control. In the 6.7 release, the current shipping release, when we shifted from our former Microsoft browser technology to HTML5, we lost some of the security control at the project and user level that we had had in the Microsoft technology. That's now fully implemented with the advisor server AE HTML um, technology. And so you can apply security at the project uh, level, uh, which will force through authentication for users coming in. I know a number of you are glad to hear that. There's a variety of other updates and performance improvements which are described in the readme notes. That's 6.8. It's um, out December, and um, well, you know when you get it. 7.0, uh, where are we headed with this? 
So this 7.0 is the culmination of the work we've done in the 6.4, 6.6, 6.7, 6.8 release. Um, first is to finish the look and feel updates. Uh, today, uh, you'll notice that our HTML5 browser interface has different icons, uh, different look and feel than the authoring tool, the Analyst and Analyst X. In 7.0, uh, they will be aligned uh, with the same look and feel. The HTML5 web client, we've also done a bunch of work to hide toolbars, uh, zoom bars that aren't needed, um, but they'll pop up when you want them. Uh, that same uh, approach will be brought to the Analyst Analyst X. We're also moving our help online. Uh, the next page has more on that. We're redoing the authoring interface on the, both the Analyst and Analyst X. So the startup experience and application flow are going to be redone. Today, when you start, you get a wizard that has uh, some demos. It's got start a new project, open an existing project that floats on a blank page. Uh, we're going to become uh, more modern with this, so we'll have uh, instructions and controls down the left. We'll have uh, help context floating on the page, and the task view will be uh, brought more visible, which is the steps you do to build a project. So we had a bunch of human factors input that we needed to get more up in the startup experience and make the flow of actually authoring a project simpler. So uh, that's coming. The actual controls. Um, and capabilities aren't changing. It's just getting organized a lot more effectively. There'll be some redesign of the navigation pane, so they'll be more capable. Uh, and then uh, a number of you suggested, why don't we have a one push button to get back to our original state, um, up to the filters. So we're going to have a, a restore all, select all combo button. You know, today, if you select exclude, select exclude, select exclude, you want to go back, you have to first restore everything and then select everything. This will be sort of return to go. Um, so that's coming. Maps, a um, bunch of input on maps. Uh, we're going to allow drill down on install maps in a project on demand, one. Um, and then we're going to talk about new mapping technology, second. So this will be basically our current maps, uh, where if you select, like on a US map, Chicago, uh, and then exclude the map will drop to the Chicago area, and then you can select a, a subregion and so forth. So it's going to use the existing map technology, current look and feel. It will work with current projects and allow uh, the maps to drill up and down. We're also uh, developing, uh, loading and utilizing multi-level maps from an external source, uh, say Google Maps for now. Uh, so these will be uh, you know, smoothly drillable. Uh, so much like in Google Maps, you can sort of scroll from the U.S. to a city, a state to a city. Uh, this will do the same, and we'll sustain our plotting data on it, the ability to interact with it. But it'll be you know in the Google Maps kind of look and feel and style. And I'm using Google Maps as an example. We're still working with which exact technology we're going to use. Uh, we're going to we're planning to do these in parallel because we don't want to disrupt current projects. So um, this would be a new capability uh, that could be used to replace the existing map capability, but this first step here will allow the existing projects that you all have out and in use to continue on without having to update them uh, at the get-go. So we've had feedback from a number of you that that's a good idea, so that's what we're doing. And last, um, improved project editing. This is actually a big one. So you, know, you build a project, um, then you want to rename the fields, uh, maybe at the entry point across the project because you don't like the database field name, uh, and you forgot to do it when you loaded data, or tables, or change currency, or precision, or change a calculation. And sometimes changing a calculation can be complex, because maybe it's a key that's used to do a roll-up of a table, which is then used to copy a field to another table, which is used in a subsequent expression, which is then shown in a bar chart. And um, sometimes if you change that, it may break things downstream, or to really change the graphics uh, look and feel. And so, you know, today we push it a little bit, but it, we don't push it all the way through in the ADVM. You need to reload as an ADV to push the changes all the way through, and then things might break that you didn't anticipate. This, this function is going to allow you to see what will break if you make this change and warn you, do you really want to do it? And if you do, it'll push it through right then and there so you'll see what happens. Um, without having to reload the data. So this is actually a, a bunch of work because of the complexity and linkage in some of these staged um, calculations. Uh, it's well along, and uh, I think it's going to have a major impact on ease of authoring changes in an existing project. So the help, um, 
removing in 7.0 the help is going to be web-based, a separate window indexed by search engine. So if you want to figure out, you know, how do you change a bar part chart to a spine plot, you can do it in Google. Or how do you, like, um, change it, uh, offset a date? Uh, that will all be uh, searchable on Google and um, um, outside of us. So all documentation, user guide, training, implementation guide, web, client, white papers. Uh, we have a video gallery of short videos. Uh, we'll be separate from this. We'll have a table of contents, index, and searching. It's going to be integrated into getting started application. So when I was talking about the changes to the Analyst, Analyst X, to make it more clear, uh, intuitive uh, on the authoring side, this will be integrated into that. And we're using Gitbooks as a technology. So a bunch of stuff coming. Six eights uh, out the door in December of 16. Uh, Seven will be out the door uh, spring of, 16, of 17. And if you have questions or want more information, um, contact us uh, at support at advisorsolutions.com. And we'd be glad to go in more detail, get you the readme files for this uh, and whatnot. Um, that's the deal. Uh, thanks for listening.